Welcome back to Module 5. In this module, we're actually only going to cover two sections out of Chapter 21. The rest show up in Module 7 when we talk about the solar system and exoplanets all together. So, in our previous video from Chapter 20, we talked about the interstellar medium, the clouds of gas and dust, including Orion's nebula at the bottom of the um, kind of sword scabbard here. If we look back at Orion, when we, took, when we take a picture in infrared light, we are able to highlight that there is a lot more gas and dust here than just Orion's nebula. Now, infrared light is lower energy, longer wavelength light than the visible. And so when we are taking images with it, we are seeing things that are cooler than stars, so warm things instead of hot things, in the same way that we human beings produce infrared light, clouds of gas and dust also produce infrared light. Orion is part of what's called a giant molecular cloud, a much larger structure than just a single portion that happens to glow as an emission nebula. Another really um, important part of Orion's nebula is the fact that when we zoom in on it, so previous slide was taking a big picture view to make sure we understand that this is part of a larger structure called giant molecular clouds. When we zoom in on it, on the left, we have visible and near infrared, and on the right, we have um, far infrared light. We can actually see little stars cocooned within this nebula where on the left they have that weird reddish color that's part of interstellar reddening, and on the right we are looking at um, wavelengths that allow us to see those stars behind the gas and dust. And we see that there are a whole lot of stars here, and they are forming all together in a star cluster. We will learn about star clusters in this module, that there are two different types, and that more often than not, stars form in star clusters rather than a single star all by itself. And that's because they can't form out of nothing. We need to form stars where we have material, and we tend to have a lot more material than just a single star's worth. Now, the other possibly more famous um, giant molecular cloud, although you may not have heard the term, giant molecular cloud before, is the Eagle Nebula. It's one of the most famous Hubble photos, um, and lots of people have it as desktop backgrounds or um, have articles of clothing or um, phone cases, things like that with it, because it is such a cool-looking picture. This is also known as the Pillars of Creation because what we are looking at and this is enhanced color. This is not all colors that our eyes would be able to see. It also includes infrared and ultraviolet. But it is showing us real structure here. On the left, we have the overall large picture of the Eagle Nebula. And you kind of have to turn your head. Um, for you, it would be this way, I guess. Um, you have, kind of have to turn your head to see what looks like an eagle with its wings out, holding maybe a salmon that it's caught in its talons. But if we zoom in for the second picture here, part B, if we zoom in on the top of that um, leftmost pillar, we start to see these little tiny blobs that seem to be breaking away from the larger um, dust cloud. Now, the overall giant molecular cloud is enormous. So these objects are 50 parsecs or more across. Now, we haven't really used that unit that much, uh, so I want to make sure we understand what that means. About um, one parsec is about three and a third light years. The very closest star to us, from the sun to the closest star, is 1.3 parsecs. So this spans a distance that is much larger than just a couple of stars um, distance across. The mass contained is 100,000 solar masses. So if we were to break this cloud of gas and dust down into sun-like stars, we could make 100,000 of them. And the temperature is very cold, a few Kelvin, 
where, as a reminder from chapter 5, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. It's the minimum possible temperature in the universe. Okay, so we have these beautiful um, pillars of creation here with all of this mass, but we can't actually make um, stars out of all of it. There's a lot of different... Um, a lot of different things that are trying to prevent collapse. But if we have an external shock wave, that shock wave might come from a nearby supernova. It might come from new stars that have formed nearby that have powerful jets or winds. It might be two giant molecular clouds um, colliding with each other. But no matter the cause, there needs to be an external source of collapse, but once that happens, we can collapse smaller, denser regions, the kind that in this previous slide, the kind that look like these little blobs or eggs, um, those are the places where stars are actively forming. When we start this process, we don't immediately have a star. We have what's called a protostar. In the same kind of way that we can have a caterpillar for a while until we have a butterfly, a protostar is a name for a particular phase that there is an object there and it is glowing, but we cannot yet call it a star. There is also something called a protostellar disk. Because of the way that physics works, the conservation of angular momentum, as this small region collapses, a lot of the excess material that doesn't go into the protostar flattens out into a protostellar disk. This is the reason why all of the planets in our own solar system all orbit in the same flat plane is because they formed out of this protostellar disk. We will talk more about planet formation in Module 7. It is covered in this chapter, so you can read ahead if you'd like to, but we will be covering that, uh, just not quite yet. Now, as the protostar continues to contract, so we had this cloud of gas and dust, this dense core is what it's called, it collapses down and forms a protostar, which continues to collapse and heat up. We can define the point where the star actually becomes a star, this whole butterfly um, from caterpillar idea. We can define the star's birth as when hydrogen fusion turns on in its core. We talked about how the sun turns hydrogen into helium in its core. That's because it is an active star that is powering itself. To go from a protostar to a star, that is the deciding factor, the determining factor. Now in this image here, in this diagram, we are looking at the path that protostars take based on their mass. Now this is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that is looking at a particular set of data. If we look at the 100 solar mass star, the 100 solar mass star, all of these numbers along the track are years, by the way. So 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years. That entire time, the 100 solar mass star is kind of just going left on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. But as we have started to explore and as we will continue to build up an understanding of, moving directly left, so keeping the same luminosity while heating up, means that you have to be lowering your size, your radius, that entire time. So moving left on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram means that that star is contracting, it is getting smaller, which is why its core is heating up and heating up. If we go down to the other extreme, a star that has a tenth the mass of the sun, it takes a million years or a hundred million years to try to reach its point where hydrogen fusion turns on. It takes a lot longer because with less mass, there is a weaker force of gravity trying to pull everything together. And we note that that particular path seems to move almost straight down, which means we are getting less and less luminosity at roughly the same temperature and that's because we're getting a smaller and smaller star. As you move down on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, you are also going to smaller sizes, to smaller radius. So for all of these paths, whether it goes down and then over, 
or mostly just down or mostly just over. In all of those cases, we are talking about protostars that are collapsing, contracting, heating up their core so that they can become stars. Okay, so we talked about in uh, chapter 16 that the sun uses what's called the proton-proton chain. We saw this picture even back in those slides. All main sequence stars, all stars that are on their normal part of their lifetime, they will be turning four hydrogen into one helium atom through fusion. However, they don't all use the proton-proton chain. The sun and other low mass stars like it, especially lower mass than the sun, they use the proton-proton chain that we described back in chapter 16. We don't need to memorize the internal order now, just like we didn't need to back then, but we do need to recognize that when we compare what goes into it to what comes out, the overall change is that four hydrogen atoms become one helium atom with energy in the form of gamma rays, neutrinos, and positrons. Positrons that then can find an electron and create more gamma rays. Now, stars with slightly higher mass than the sun, they have a stronger force of gravity, which means they need to power themselves more efficiently. They need to go through a process that is faster. And so the proton-proton chain isn't actually enough for those stars. They use a more efficient process called the CNO cycle. CNO comes from carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, which if you look at the internal ring of this um, image here, we are seeing that that's what's happening, is that carbon is being turned into nitrogen, which radioactively decays back to a different isotope of carbon, which fuses to create a different isotope of nitrogen, which fuses to create a different isotope of oxygen, which radioactively decays to a different isotope of nitrogen, and then through fusion creates that same carbon we started with and a little helium nucleus, um, or helium, yeah, nucleus comes out. This is super complicated. We also don't need the internal order here, but what we want to recognize is that the parts that actually go into it compared to the parts that come out and aren't reused is the same end result. Four hydrogen turns into one helium and the same amount of energy, it just happens a lot faster. So we can go through and we can um, change all of this mass into energy at a faster rate, being able to push back against gravity a little bit better. So you might be thinking, why isn't the sun using this process if it's better? This process requires a higher core temperature than the sun has. That higher core temperature is the result of a higher mass star having more gravity pulling it down um, and contracting it. And so it's the natural process available for only high mass stars and not the sun. As a reminder, all of this is based on this balance between the inward pull of gravity and the outward push of pressure called hydrostatic equilibrium. And this balance is the single most important concept to have in the back of your mind as we go through all of the different things that happen to stars when fusion runs out in their core. Because every single time it can be attributed to an imbalance because either gravity is too strong or the pressure is too high. And so something happens to that star because it is no longer balanced in this equilibrium state. Now, because stars are all using hydrogen fusion to provide that outward pressure, once we know the amount of mass it has, there is a defined temperature, luminosity, and size that it is able to have while it is going through that fusion process on the main sequence. This is why that main sequence is such a thin and narrow band through the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is because of hydrostatic equilibrium setting limits on what stars are able to look like. The other key thing to keep in mind, stars get to the main sequence on this diagram that we saw before, we call them zero age main sequence when they get there. And that's kind of when they turn on, 
And they stay there, and they stay there until they've used up all of the hydrogen in their core because they've turned it all into helium. They run out at some point. So I want you to think about um, a question here. It's a little bit open-ended, although really there's only two options, but I want you to describe for yourself, either write out an explanation in your notebook or tell the person next to you um, or text a friend what you're thinking about this particular question. A more massive star has more stuff in its core to be able to burn, kind of a bigger fuel tank. But it also has a stronger force of gravity. If a more massive star is burning hydrogen into helium, do you expect it to have a longer or shorter lifetime than our sun? We will go through the answer, but I want us to understand if our intuition is on the right track or not, so we know if we have to fix this incorrect thinking we have or just build on a correct kind of initial guess. So pause and think about that question. Okay. So I mentioned the first time that we saw this graph that all of these numbers are in years, telling us how quickly stars are able to get to the main sequence. This same trend exists for all aspects of a star's lifetime. The high mass stars go through everything much, much faster because gravity is such a powerful force that they have to be fighting against. Gravity is able to condense them down very quickly Gravity, that much stronger gravity, is causing them to have to go through all of their materials so much faster, and so they run out so much sooner. High mass stars will die first. They will leave the main sequence first. And in fact, if we look at a set of um, main sequence stars, star A is a main sequence star for 7 billion years. That means that after it reached the main sequence, it turned hydrogen into helium in its core for 7 billion years. Star B is a main sequence star for 20 million years, and star C is a main sequence star for 90,000 years. So think back to what we mentioned just before, which is a following, which of the following is a true statement about these stars? So another pause and think question for us. All right, now, high mass stars go through their lives much faster. Star C has the greatest amount of mass, option two here. And notice, I didn't need to tell us anything else about those stars. I didn't need to tell us their temperature or their luminosity or anything. The lifetime is based entirely on the mass. So star C has the most mass, Star A has the least mass, but even star A has a shorter lifetime than the sun. So star A has a little bit more mass than the sun does. The statement that I need us to understand or the concept that I need us to understand out of this um, portion of the chapter that we're covering is that mass is the single most important property of a star. To begin with, mass tells us if we can even make a star at all. There is a minimum mass to make a star. We need at least 0 0.08 times the mass of the sun. So eight hundredths the mass of the sun. Because if we don't have that much, we won't make a star. We'll make a failed star. We mentioned briefly in the previous module that those are called a brown dwarf. And it's worth noting that Jupiter is even less than that. So Jupiter is a failed brown dwarf, and a brown dwarf is a failed star. So Jupiter kind of failed twice. Sorry, Jupiter. There is, an also, there is also an upper limit on the mass of a star, too. If you have too much mass in the thing that is trying to condense down to form a star, it will be unstable, and you'll be able to split up and make a binary system, possibly more than two stars even. The upper limit on a star's mass is a little less well-defined because we are able to add to our understanding with computer simulations, but if we find a star at a certain mass, 
that also tells us what is actively possible and what is not possible. So it's about 120 solar masses, though you, see, you may see slightly different numbers um, in different references, and that's okay too. 100, 120 solar masses. There is an upper limit, we just don't know the exact number for it. But that's just because of instability. Now, once we make a star, the mass of that star tells us everything about it. It will tell us how large or small in size it is while it is on the main sequence. That is because of hydrostatic equilibrium. It will tell us how quickly a star goes through its fuel. We talked about the mass luminosity relation for binary stars. It's how we're able to use the results from binary star searches to um, approximate a star's mass if we know its luminosity. It is important for us to now understand that the mass luminosity relation still comes from hydrostatic equilibrium. Mass tells us how much gravity is pulling inwards. And luminosity, the rate at which we're generating energy, is telling us how much that outward pressure um, is going to be. And those are related to each other. And in the upcoming set of slides, mass will tell us what happens when those fuel tanks run out. So this particular chapter has been getting us a sense of how stars form and what happens as they are just sitting on the main sequence. Our upcoming chapters and our upcoming set of videos will tell us what happens after that point. So I will see you in the next video.